So the Lord's been speaking this week to me and, and to Sue as well, um, through his word, through his spirit, and, and through, as a, as a focal point, some of the, um, <coughs> the devotionals from Smith Littlesworth this week that were during this week. Um, just speaking about unity, and how, how important it is, and how much the Lord loves it. And as we know, you know, it's like those great Old Testament scriptures, the, the Psalms, you know, the unity, uh, how precious it is. It's like oil running down the beard of Aaron, and, and um, you know, that that's where he commands the blessing, um, it, where there is unity. And of course, he's been speaking a lot in this season um, to many of us, um, not just us that are associated with this fellowship of believers, but with many fellowships, just speaking about the importance of the unity of his universal church, um, that we are to be in unity with one another to the, to the extent that we can be, um, that we would you know, emphasize what we have in common, that is Jesus, and that's the most important thing to have in common, Jesus, um, and, and that sort of thing, and, and that that's how the Lord is going to, to, to move in this land. He's going to move through his church, and his church needs to be stepping in unity. Um, so, but what th this week, what the Lord's been sharing and putting on my heart was, was in addition to the, that big picture kind of unity, the unity between brother and sister, the unity within a fellowship, the unity within a marriage and a family, the unity within a community, these kinds of things. And it's so important because the enemy knows. <laughs> he knows the power of unity, whether it be in the universal church as a whole, or whether it be within a, a, a local body, or within a family, in a marriage. He knows the power of it. And he devotes many resources to destroying that unity. And we have to be so, so aware of this. Um, because he is a lion who is prowling and seeking, moving back and forth. Where can I find my way in? And it's so easy um, to allow offense to come in, to allow grievance to come in, to allow bitterness, judgment, condemnation, strife, contention. And it's one thing so easy to allow it, okay? But that's not the worst of it. The worst of it is we allow it, and then we let it fester. We don't deal with it. And our Lord has given us instructions for how to deal with these things. And we need to take these things very seriously, because the Lord takes them seriously, and because the enemy is seeking to rob, to kill, he wants to come in and tear to pieces like a gnashing lion. He wants to rip to shreds the unity because that's the power. That's the strength. That's the blessing. Whether it be in a marriage, a family, a church body, or just among neighbors and, and friends and acquaintances and perhaps people who, you know, workmates and colleagues and bosses and <laughs> employees and and all that, sons and daughters and spouses and all of that, guys. I mean, even, you know, it's like not just among those who call upon the name of Jesus. Because our desire is for everybody to receive Jesus. And indeed, every relationship that you have that is with somebody who is not saved is a divine uh, arrangement <laughs> for you to bring the light of Jesus into that person's life. And if there is contention and strife and we're no better than the world in terms of dealing with it, then how can we bring the, the, the beauty of Jesus into those people's lives? So, I'm just going to read this to begin with. Ephesians chapter 4 from verse 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness gentleness, with long-suffering, bearing with one another 
in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Wow. I mean, that's how to say, those, those are not words of a man. Those are words that were written in heaven and communicated by the Holy Spirit to uh, an earthen vessel named Paul, who was called Saul. That's what those are. It says in the Passion, always demonstrate gentleness and generous love towards one another, especially towards those who may try your patience. <laughs> <laughs> Bearing with one another in love, endeavoring with long suffering to keep the unity of the spirit of the bond of peace. Long suffering. We really don't know a lot about long suffering, guys. Long suffering is just that absolute suffering. No. Holy <laughs> it's, it, it, it's 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 putting up with, but not in the the connotation that that has, putting up with, oh, I'll put up with you. It's putting up with, it's bearing with, but it's doing it steadfastly and with the love of Jesus. And it is humanly impossible to do. Do you know that? What I just read there, I said those weren't words from the man, they're words from heaven. And guess what? It takes supernatural power to walk in the way that those words are, you know, beseeching us to walk. We cannot do it in our flesh. It is impossible. We read all these mighty, you know, things, these words that Jesus tells us, you know, about what the life of a disciple looks like. And all of those things are impossible. If we try and keep them as rules, we will fail. Okay? If we try and keep them as duties, we will fail. Why? Because the whole point of all those exhortations that Jesus gives us in being his disciple. The whole point is, you go beyond your duty. It has nothing to do with your duty. It's because you have become, as Paul says, he is a prisoner of the Lord, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, which means you have taken all those rights that you have to vindicate yourself, to fight back, to revile when you're being reviled, to curse your enemy, um, you know, not to give, give the other cheek, but to fight back. Not to, um, you know, when you've been compelled to go one mile, to go with the extra mile. Not to do all, you have a right to, to, to do, to not do all those things because they're beyond your duty. <laughs> they're beyond. They're above and beyond. But if you have taken up your cross and denied yourself, then you have handed over your rights to somebody. Give him our rights to ourselves, and we say, now I just do what you want me to do. I am your slave. I am your prisoner. We don't have to do that, guys. We do not have to do that to be saved. But Jesus says, if anyone, anyone, any man desires to be my disciple, these are the things that he does. Okay? We hand over our rights to him if we want to be disciples. That is a glorious place to be. Because that is the place where mighty, mighty, the mighty power of God comes in to this frail, fickle, weak, earthen vessel for the glory of God. And it doesn't come otherwise. The second we start asserting our rights to ourselves again, I am not standing up here in judgment, by the way, because it is so easy to do. It is so easy, as I've said before, at the beginning of every day, I say to Jesus, I give you my right to myself. I take up my cross today, mm -hmm. Jesus. Mm -hmm. But sometimes by the end of the day, I realized, or maybe the next morning, I realized that by the end of the previous day, I've snatched those rights right back out of Jesus' hands. Okay? It's not about beating ourselves up. It's about recognizing how important this is. And about every time... If I fall or if I fail, right? Mm -hmm. Every single time we get back up, mm -hmm. we cry out for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. He comes with this restorative, redeeming power on the basis not of anything that are good that I've done, but on the basis of what he did on this cross. He comes and he makes all things new every single day. Mm -hmm. That's what he does if mm -hmm. we allow him to. That's what his desire is to do. Mm -hmm. And we say, Lord, Today, let this be 
a new day. Let this be a day, Lord, where I don't run off chasing the cares of the world. You know, when I say run off, we can do it physically, we can do it mentally, emotionally, but I just fly off into my own little world by the end of the day because there's all these things I'm juggling, all these things that are pressing in and whew, dissipation. Whew, spirit leaves right out. That's why sometimes I have to do a devotional more than once a day. That's a good practice to get into. That's a really, really healthy, healthy practice to get into. You do your devotion in the morning, you're all filled up with the Holy Spirit. You seek at His face. He's pouring out upon you. You're, you're baptized afresh in the Spirit. It's like whoosh, gushing out of you. You're like, all right, I'm ready to go spray some of this on somebody. And you go out, and then halfway through the day, you're like, whew, deflated. Spiritual leakage creeps in because of the demands of the day or the cares of the world or whatever. Okay? minutes to go back into your prayer closet, to go back in and just fill back up, to just lay your contrite heart, your broken spirit before the Lord and go, Lord, I can't even get through a full day without a recharge of you. Can you come? Because I need you so much to be who you've called me to be. And I so desire to be a bondservant of Jesus Christ. Help me. on and says in verse 4, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. <laughs> are we getting the gist of this? The body of Christ is one. We worship one Lord. There is one Spirit at work in us. Okay? At least, <laughs> unless of course we're partnering with other spirits. But you know what I mean? In the church as a whole, if it is a Spirit-filled church, okay? The Holy Spirit is one. Okay? The body is one. The Lord is one. And therefore, and the God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all, it's him Almighty, Almighty God, who is above everything, it's Him who works in each of us. Mm -hmm. That's what makes us one. Through His Spirit, makes us one body. And Paul, you know, talks elsewhere about the body of Christ and how, you know, the unity that's in that, it's not a unity of, 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 of function, because we have different roles. It's like the body of a human being. There's different roles for each part, but there is an integral unity to the human body. And no part can despise the other because they're all necessary. And they're all working towards the good of the whole. That's what we're supposed to be like as a church. How do we do that? Well, we do it because he's given us these amazing gifts and offices that come supernaturally. <laughs> and Paul goes on in the next section of this chapter to talk about these gifts that Christ gives and the offices, the five-fold ministry. Okay? And it's so important we have that ministry operating in divine order, not people running off on a, you know, their own sort of Hey, I got this gift. I'm gonna go be a. Ooh, loose. I'm gonna go be a, a, a. What's the word? A free agent, a wild cowboy. A, you know, we're supposed to be working together. The apostles, the prophets, the teachers, the pastors, the evangelists, working together. For what purpose? Skip down to verse twelve. For the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ. So that's what the offices are for, the gifts are for. Equipping the saints, okay, so that they can do the work, the commission that God's called them to do. We need equipped, right? 
because we're just earthen vessels. We don't have what it takes. We need the equipment. Through these offices, we are equipped. For the edifying of the body, that's the building up of the body, the strengthening of the body, not the tearing down, not the, the ripping apart, the building up, the strengthening of the body of Christ. Verse 13, the final purpose, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man. That means a complete man, being complete in Christ, completely transformed, as Paul speaks elsewhere, from glory to glory into the image of Jesus Christ. That is what each of you have been made and called to do and to be. Every single one of us, this is the purpose of the church, is to come to this place where each one of us, in unity with one another, is complete in Jesus Christ. And as Paul describes what that com completion in Jesus Christ looks like, it is, continuing on in verse 13, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That is a measure <laughs> which I so earnestly yearn to have. <laughs> a measure the measure of the stature of the fullness. That means having the completion of Jesus. Jesus gets all of me and I get all of him. <coughs> Excuse me. And we can only do that together. In that bond of unity, the unity of the faith, Amen. where our faith is not mixture and distributed and weak, but is one, an integral, mm -hmm. unified faith. That's a powerful church. That's a church that takes back nations yes. for Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And we all have a part to play in this. On the big scale, in terms of relationships with other denominations and other bodies, but also on the small scale. Responsibility here. Okay. Paul said earlier there, we read in verse 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. You keep that unity of the Spirit, this bond of peace rests upon you. You are bonded together, connected together in perfect peace. The peace of the Lord. The peace which does not get upset by circumstances and by change and by all the rest of it. We are bonded together in peace. The peace of the Lord. The peace that Jesus gives and he does not give us the world. When we have this unity of spirit and we're to endeavor, okay? Endeavor. That's a powerful word. Endeavor. It's not, it, mean, it doesn't mean we just sort of give it a shot, and if it doesn't work out, oh well. Okay? Endeavor. It means we seek the Lord about how, where there has been strife and contention entering in, how to bring reconciliation, whatever the cost. Amen. Whatever Jesus says, whatever the cost. And sometimes the cost is a really, really high cost. Why? Because we have to swallow our pride, put away our ego, and just be willing to go and let the person think whatever they want to think of us. But we need to go. We need to go to that person. Okay? I want to read a little bit more before I get into some details about how we can do this, some specifics that Jesus gives us. You, uh, you move forward to um, a couple books to Colossians. And look at Colossians chapter 3. And we're looking from verse 12. Colossians 3 verse 12. 
Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, he's talking about you guys, <laughs> you are the elect of God, Amen. holy and beloved. You are holy, not because you're really good at, you know, looking good and keeping the rules and all that. You are holy because Jesus has washed you in his blood and because he has placed his nature within you. In other words, you are holy to no credit of your own. <laughs> now, of course, we have a responsibility once he's done that to allow that to manifest itself in every area of our lives. And that's a journey, and that's a battle, and the flesh wars against the spirit, and so on and so forth. But the point is, our holiness does not come from that. It's the other way around. He places our holiness within us, and from that, from the holiness he's placed, the good treasure he's placed in my heart, good things come forth. Okay? Good behavior, good thoughts, good actions, good words, okay, come from the, his holiness that he's placed in me. I don't get to take any credit for them. And thank God, I don't need to take credit for them, because if I did, that would imply that somehow I would have to earn my holiness. And guess what? I ain't getting anywhere near heaven if I've got to earn my holiness. I'll go with this. I will glory in the cross of Jesus Christ and in nothing else. Certainly not this flesh, because I know it all too well. So, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, and remember, you are beloved as well. That means God loves you with a furious, unconditional love. So I just break off right now in the name of Jesus Christ any lack of understanding or intimacy or love from God because it is yeah. real. He loves you. And if the devil tries to tell you, oh, you're not good enough for God, how could he possibly love you? Then I just trample that voice in the name of Jesus Christ because you are loved. But wait a minute, Joseph, you don't know this thought I had yesterday. You don't know what I was doing earlier in the week. I don't care. I don't need to know. Jesus knows and he loves you nonetheless because of his blood when the Father looks at you. He doesn't see that junk. He only sees his precious son. That is why you are a co-heir with Jesus Christ. That is why you are adopted in a wild olive branch, adopted in to the cult of Beloved. Where were we? Um, 15? Yes, thank you. Um, uh, oh, so I'll just do 12 over again. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on, given that you're all these things I've just said you are, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long Bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. Wow. Wow. Don't you see? This is how the world will know us. This is how the world will know us. Because when the world spits on us, we love them back. When they revile us and curse us, we bless them. When they try and destroy us, we reconcile ourselves to them in as much as we can. This is wild, guys. It is wild. It is totally outside the economy of this yes. world. It is purely God's economy. It is His way. It is his wisdom, and the wisdom of God is foolishness to the world. It is the way of Jesus Christ. When I was spinning and trampling upon Jesus, upon his blood, upon his cross, he loved me, and he died for me while I was crucifying him. It's the way, it's the higher way, it's the way of Almighty God. And there's no use.
you say is too hard. Because all these things are too hard anyway. All we need is more of Jesus, and we can do it. But the first step is to acknowledge it. This is your word, Lord. This is your word. for their well-being by parents by people in authority over them who were meant to shepherd and care for them they've been ravaged and savagely treated by them so was Jesus so was Jesus betrayed abused abandoned by those that he came to save the promised one the Messiah should say here, it's important to understand, of course, in all of this that I'm saying today, it's not about the Lord, first and foremost, doesn't want you to have aspects of your relationships that are involving ungodly soul ties, and he doesn't want people to be in abusive relationships just for the sake of trying to reconcile. Okay, that's a different situation, okay? If you are in some kind of abusive relationship, then that means actually you have ungodly soul ties between you and that person because guess what? Our God is not a God of abuse. He is our God of control and manipulation and all that stuff. Okay? So you need to seek the Lord on how you, He wants you to deal with that, how He wants you to break those ungodly soul ties with that person or persons. Okay? And then how to move forward. Okay? There will be times when the Lord will say, listen, you need to pull away from that relationship for a while, okay? Okay? But the key is not to have contempt in your heart and not to do it in anger and all those kinds of things, okay? And to pray earnestly that the Lord will provide a route, a way forward for reconciliation and for recreating that relationship in a way that does not involve ungodly soul ties, okay? If that is the will of the Lord. And I suppose from what you're saying, it's very difficult. You know, there's a lot of emotional abuse and things like that. And where yeah. do you go? Well, that's abuse and that's what you do. Yes, I do. Only, the, only the spirit. Only the spirit. Only the spirit. Only the spirit. Seek yeah. the Lord on it. And he, if, 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 what does James say in James chapter 1? If anyone lacks wisdom. Hello, brother. Come on. Hello. Hey, hey, come on. Hey, Stephen. Glad you guys could make it. Hello. Hello. If, um, where was, where was, where was your comfort? Where was your comfort? So, as James says, he, the Lord gives liberally, generously to all who ask. If any of you lacks wisdom, ask. But ask in faith. Not being like the double-minded man that's tossed to and fro on the waves. Okay, that man can't expect he's going to receive anything. What does that mean? It means if I ask for wisdom, and the Lord tells me what the wisdom is, the wisdom of God, and I go, Ooh, uh, that's just how would I go down that? Uh, I'm just not going to do that. Then, I'm not going to receive anything. Toss back and forth until I'm willing to stand upon the word of God. Okay, so we ask for wisdom. In He will, He will give you something, and if you're not sure about it, He will confirm it in due time. Okay, and then go with it, run with it. Whatever He says to you, just do it. As Mary said to the servants at the wedding feast in Cana. When Jesus did his first miracle. Whatever he tells you, just do it. <laughs> but he's telling us to fill these things with water, but actually it's the wine that we want. <laughs> just do it. <laughs> so, Paul goes on here. But above, verse 14, um, oh 
sorry guys, uh, we're, we're in Colossians chapter 3, um, if you've got your Bibles, and we'll, so from verse 14, Colossians 3, from verse 14. But above all these things put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, in other words, be utterly drenched, doused, swamped in this word, utterly just in it, drown in it, dive into it daily. Have this. This is wisdom. It is a lamp unto your feet. It is a light to give you the guidance and the godly wisdom that you need. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. That last verse there that I read, verse 17, is a great guide for knowing if you're engaging in something that it, that is something God doesn't want you to engage in. All you got to do, you don't got to go look it up, the, the, all the commandments and Leviticus and everything. All you got to do is you got to go, Lord, I'm going to do this unto you. Mm -hmm. And the Lord will give you an instant check. Yeah. If he's like, you can't pray to can't really do that unto me because that's not of me. Mm -hmm. Okay? <laughs> so, do that. Say that over the things that you're putting your hand to. promise you, the Holy Spirit, if you say that sincerely, will stop you if it's something that he wants you to, you know, not be involved in. And it may be a thing that he doesn't want any of his people to be involved in, but it may be a thing that he just doesn't want you involved in because of this season in your life, because of what he's doing, okay, because of how he's leading you. He may say, actually, I know you can give me an argument for there's nothing, that there's nothing bad in that thing, that TV program. But would you just do this for me? Would you not watch it? Because I'm going to bring blessing through that mm -hmm. to you. Okay. So whatever it is. Okay. Joe, before you go on, could you just explain in Dick and Dora language <laughs> when you say ungodly soul ties? I know we're talking about. Could you tell me as as fundamental as basically as you can? What is an ungodly soul tie? Okay, well it's when you're, you're unequally yoked to somebody. In other words, your yoke to them takes priority over your yoke to God. God. Yes. Okay. That and works. what that usually, what usually then results from that is, um, is control, manipulation, uh, abuse of some yes. kind, um, and, and, and uh, contention and strife and, and, and depression and heaviness and all those kinds of things. Yeah. When Jesus is not being the first. So all we have to do, if we're concerned about any relationship, mm -hmm. is just commit that relationship to the Lord and say, Jesus, forgive me, please show me by the light of your spirit. If, if there is any aspect of this relationship where mm -hmm. I'm putting it above you. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, I dealt with ungodly soul ties, but when you were just speaking yeah. there, yeah. something in me said, come on, you need to get this cut. Oh, yeah, that's true. I thought I dealt with that. Well, you can. And he said, well, you need it again. Yeah. Yeah. And I just, Sometimes that's I, necessary. And that's why I asked yeah, you yeah. just for the complete yeah. mm -hmm. basic. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Amen. Okay, guys, what we're going to do now is we're going to look at one more thing before we look at some of the words that Jesus says that gives us really, really wonderful divine guidance. How, what, what, the sort of, you know, the divine order that needs to be in how we do things. Uh -huh. Um, not, you know, look, it's not about, if we don't do this, it's not about rules and regulations. It's about Jesus giving us a picture of the way things work properly. When we, This is how things, this is the divine order, that when you put this order in place in your life, you know, then it's going to be maximized, the, the, the blessing and, 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 the, and the, the kingdom come and all that sort of, you know, here on earth, that sort of thing. Um, it's like in a marriage, you know, that the... 
The divine order is for the husband to be the spiritual authority, the one that, that, that and again, as you, many of you know, that's not, uh, the spiritual authority does not mean, as I've taught before, the bossy one. <laughs> the spiritual authority means the one who is answerable to God for the people that he is the authority over. Okay, spiritual authority is all about responsibility. It's not about rights. It's not about, I get to do this, and I get to do that. It's about, if things are wrong in my family, who does God look to? It looks to me. The buck stops here. Okay, so um, in any event, the point is that um, when when we have that divine order in our marriages, um, then that ma God's purposes in our marriage are maximized. But God's a realist. God knows that that divine order doesn't always exist because uh, you know the, it's not always the case that the, the for example a husband in a marriage is willing to step in to that role of, as spiritual authority because it is. All responsibilities, and it is a burden. Okay, um, we need to understand that. You know, too often spiritual authority is touted as some sort of great privilege. It's not. It is a burden. Okay, but it's a burden that the Lord carries with us if we if we roll it onto His shoulders. Um, and it's beautiful in action to see that divine order. Okay, so too in these things that we're going to look at. The thing is, guys. Paul knows as he's writing this, okay, he knows when he's writing to the church, the Holy Spirit, the Lord God Almighty knows the temptations that we have. He knows the things that we're prone to. He understands, no one understands the human heart better than Jesus does, did, does. and Jesus was tempted in every single way as we were, and yet as we are, and yet without sin, okay, so Jesus can empathize with us. He gets it when relationships break down. He says, you're going to have trouble in this world. you got this enemy, okay? And he's sneaky, and he's creepy. Yeah, yeah. And he's a, he's, a, he's a ripper, and a terror, and a violator, and a deceiver, and a liar, and a murderer, yeah. okay? He knows. He gets it. So it's not about, like, you know, beating ourselves up because we've allowed this thing in. But if we allow, once we've, once, you know, we realize, and it's important to be real about this, because we have to realize that in any relationship, guys, we have a responsibility, no matter how much we may think, it's all the other person's fault. Any relationship, I promise you, if a relationship breakdown, it takes two, guys, it takes two. We have a responsibility as well. It may not be, you know, the Lord may be holding that other person much more accountable than, than he's holding us, okay? But nonetheless, we have a role. We are endeavoring, you see. We're endeavoring. We're putting everything that we are into this. Seeking the Lord on it. Endeavoring to keep that bond, that unity, that peace. Okay? As Paul says elsewhere, in as much as is possible. I don't know, what's he say? He said, keeping, um, keeping the bond. How, how's it go? Um, have peace with all men in as much as it is possible. possible. Yeah, as, as much as it depends upon you. That's what he says. Mm -hmm. And what we're going to see when we read Jesus' words actually depends upon us quite a bit. More so than, than the common sense in the world wants to say. Because the world's going to say, oh look, if that person spits on you, that's clearly their fault. So, you know, that's their problem. Okay, you're, you're, you're fine. You're justified. You're good. But that's not how Jesus sees it because we have a responsibility. And it does depend upon us. Okay? To bless and not curse. To forgive. Because the more we curse and the more we don't forgive, the more we hold that person in continued bondage. We keep them in their bondage. And we keep, we, uh, through unforgiveness, we can keep ourselves in, in bondage as well. So we have a role here. We have to be real about this. We can't be like, oh look, I'm a spiritual Christian. So obviously this is not my part. <laughs> you know, because that person over there is the one. They're in the world. They're all that stuff. Or whatever. You know, we have to realize that we all have fallen, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And we all can get it wrong, okay? And so what we have to do is humble ourselves before the Lord. I say, Jesus, what do you want me to do? Here's the situation. Here's the situation. There's a relationship breakdown here, okay, in whatever area of your life. There's a relationship breakdown, and I want to humble myself before you and just ask you to show me, Lord, to what extent I'm responsible for that. And tell me what to do here, Lord. Because this is grieving this relationship breakdown. Okay? 
So, this is now we're going to look at some things that Jesus, some guidance he gives us on these things. Let's look first um, at Matthew um, chapter 23. Sorry, just wait a second. But can you have a soul tie to something? Oh, sorry, Matthew, sorry, just Matthew chapter 5. It was verse 23. I was looking at Matthew chapter 5. Sorry. Yes. Can you have what? A soul tie to something like said. Mine, well, it wouldn't be a soul tie, um, because normally, yeah, normally a soul tie is between two different souls, right? Yeah. But um, certainly, you know, Paul says elsewhere, do not be unequally yoked to the world. Yeah. And Jesus says you can't serve God and mammon. Yeah. Right, so you can't have these, uh, these, you can be unequally yoked, which is basically just to be an adultery, right? If you're unequally yoked, again, it means that you're, 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 that thing is taking God's place yes. in your so life. Yes, What's that? And, well, I, that's what no. I would say, yeah. Can yeah. I just, if, if you're in, sorry, <laughs> if you're in an abusive relationship and you're not, you know, they're being abusive yeah. to you, but you're still, God is first with you, yeah. that's still an yeah. other social yeah. time though, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. You can be putting yes. God first in that and you're really praying about it, but the person is well, changing. Well, it may be, except to the extent that you just have to ask God what to do. So suppose you're in this abusive relationship but you're putting God first in your life, well then God's going to be speaking to you about this abusive relationship. Mm -hmm. And he might be saying to you, um, you need to take action. Yeah. You need to pull away. You need to do something like that. Right, so the fact that you say it, it might be yes. the fact that you're not listening to God. It might be. It might be, yes, yes of course. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. Look, th these are difficult questions, and, and we have to, you know, seek prayer on these things. Mm -hmm. Pray yourself, seek the Lord on it, but also... You know, if there's a two or three, you know, or one or two even brothers or sisters that you really trust, you know, press in in prayer with them on these things. Um, and at the end of the day, it has to be the Holy Spirit that's telling you what to do, not a human being. Okay. Also, you can take your freedom from the person and the Spirit's control, manipulation, and the yes. abuse that are in the person Absolutely. you're in a relationship. Absolutely. You can, you can take authority. Well, even even if they're not, you can still take authority over these things. Yeah. And it all depends on how the Lord leads. The Lord might, be, might lead you to stay in it, but say, look, stir up your faith. Pray against those evil spirits that that person is partnering with, um, and I will protect you. you know, that sort of thing. So it just depends. Okay, so look at um, Matthew chapter 5, verse 23. Now, we're all familiar with this, this little passage here. Jesus says, therefore, if you bring your gift... To the altar, okay, and of course it's a therefore because it's following on. What is that saying that you used to say, Barbara? If there's a therefore, there's a reason it's there. We have to find out what it's there for. <laughs> so whenever there's a therefore, it means it, it follows from what, what came before. And before, of course, Jesus is teaching about how contempt in my heart is actually a spirit of murder. If I have contempt in my heart for somebody else, that's a spirit of murder. Um, so you can't say, oh, look, I've never murdered. I'm completely innocent. I keep the law. Um, if you've ever had contempt of murder. Okay? Um, so Jesus is trying to say just how thorough the law is. Okay? <laughs> and how basically nobody's ever kept it except for him. He's the only one that fulfilled the law. Um, so anyway, um, because of that, because that's like murder, having contempt in your heart, he goes on, verse, therefore... Verse 23, therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you. But it's interesting, he doesn't say, there remember that you have contempt in your heart. Now, you may have contempt in your heart if, if your brother has something against you. But he's focusing on the fact that the brother has contempt towards you, has something against you. Okay? Leave your gift there before the altar, verse 24, and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Okay, so what he's saying is, and, and the thing is, you know, Smithy talks about this in, in one of his um, teachings, but the thing is, listen, you know, we too often look at this and go, okay, um, if I'm, you know, if I, if, I need, if I need to make something right, this is saying, look, I can't, you know, if I've wronged somebody, I need to go make it right, okay? Yes, it is saying that, but that's the easy, <laughs> that's the easy interpretation, because guess what it's also saying? It's saying, if my brother has wronged me, yeah. I need to go make it right. Wow. <laughs> and that's, that's, again, that goes, that just like throws common sense on its head. Mm -hmm. No, that's not my responsibility. That's his responsibility. Mm -hmm. That's not what Jesus says. Okay? So 
So Paul says, in as much as it depends upon you, keeping the peace with all men, a lot of it depends on you. Not everything, okay? Not everything. And sometimes when we do this, you know, in accordance with how Jesus leads us, you know, it's just the person doesn't receive it, okay? And then that's, you know, you just, you just leave them to the Lord then, okay? But the point is, you have a responsibility. I have a responsibility. And it's no use going to the service and praising, offering up the sacrifice of praise and going, yeah, Lord, you're awesome, you're great. This guy hates me over here, but you're awesome and you're great. There's nothing I can do about that, but you're awesome and you're great. And he's saying, whoa, that's not what I want. Go sort that out. Then come glorify me. Then come give me my gift. Okay? You have a responsibility here. Okay? So, how does that work then? How does that work? We go, the person that's wronged us, we go and try and make it right. How does that work? What are those words we just read? Long-suffering, humility, bearing with one another in love, forgiving one another. Okay? Is there anybody in here who thinks they don't have need of forgiveness? I doubt very seriously there is. Then if you agree with me that we all have need of forgiveness, does it really cost you that much to go to somebody? But I didn't do anything. Look, we've all done something. Okay? <laughs> Trust me. That's what Jesus is teaching about here. We all need forgiveness. Go to that brother and say, forgive me. Go to that sister. Forgive me. I promise you that will heap coals on their head. <laughs> They'll be like, why is this person asking for forgiveness? Me? But this is the power that's the power of Jesus' way. And it's foolishness to the world. But it's power. He goes on here and says, verse 25, Agree with your adversary quickly while you're on the way with them. Now it's important to understand he's not talking about adversary here in the way because, you know, the devil is the adversary, right? Okay? Um, but that's, he's not saying agree with the devil. Okay? What he's talking, he's, it, this is a word that's um, associated with courtroom cases. So it's, the person who has something that's taking you to court, basically, for some reason, you know. And this was a rather litigious kind of culture, you know, at this time. Just as it is today. <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, people were constantly taking people to court, which is why Paul chastises, I can't remember, was it the Corinthians? Uh, the Corinthians, for actually taking the things that they have against each other to the, to the secular, the worldly court. He's like, you don't know, we're going to be judging angels? Can't we work this out, you know? Um, but the point is what Jesus is saying here is he's saying, look, if that person has, if somebody has a claim against you, a, 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 you know, a suit against you, <laughs> I mean, it doesn't have to be, he's using the, the language of everyday life. That's what Jesus did. He used the language of everyday life because that's what people would understand. You know, talk about sparrows and barns and, and harvests and all this stuff, Okay. Um, and going to court, okay? But it's not, that's not what this is about spiritually. It's about being in that kind of relationship where that relationship has broken down with somebody and they have something against you, okay? And what he's saying here is, is agree with them while you were on the way with them. In other words, he's taking you to court, you're on the way with them. Agree with them before you get to the court. Lest your adversary deliver you to the judge, the judge hand you over to the officer and you be thrown into prison. Assuredly, I say to you, you will by no means get out of there till you pay the last penny. Okay, but Jesus, Jesus isn't talking here about the, himself, the righteous judge and all that. He's talking about the society, and the society is filled with unrighteous judges, okay? And the point simply is that it doesn't matter if you think you're in the right, okay? If you don't, you know, humble yourself and just apologize, just ask forgiveness, just agree with the person, okay? If you don't make that effort of reconciliation up front, at the beginning of the fallout, a process gets set in motion. Yeah. And how, is there anybody here who can't relate to this? I can yeah. so relate to this, where you just go, nope, I'm just, I'll just wait till that person, you know, does what they're supposed to do. Yeah. And you 
pay the last penny. It goes on days and weeks and sometimes years and decades. And there's this horrible burden, this chain, because of this lack of reconciliation, because of this contempt and this contention between you and another person, and you pay the last penny. How much easier it would have been just to deal with it at the beginning. That's what Jesus is saying here. Turn with me to another mighty, awesome, holy, and completely foolish um, instruction from Jesus. <laughs> so this is in um, Matthew chapter 18. See, this, what we're going to read here goes so against our human nature. Why? Because our human nature is to take the path of least resistance, the easiest path. And what Jesus is saying here, the divine order that's to be put into place when there is a breakdown, when there is an offense against another, the divine order that's to be put in place there is the hard way. And he says, do the hard way first. And none of us do that. Or very few of us do. This is what he says. This is um, Matthew 18 from verse 15. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. You and him alone. If he hears you, you've gained your brother. Praise the Lord. But if he will not hear, then take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, then tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. Okay? You see, there's a process. What do we actually do in reality? We go to other people first and we talk about that person. And we tell everybody else about how terrible that person is. Okay? And then, if it's in the church setting, or if it, maybe it could be in a work setting, we go to a boss, or it's in a, if it's in a church setting, we go to the pastor and we start complaining to the pastor. You're going to have to do something about this because you know what this person did? Have you spoken to this person about this? Mm -hmm. Have you gone to them? To you and him alone? This is the divine order, guys. This is the way. You go to other people about it, you're just going to get caught up in slander and gossip and all the rest of it. Okay. You go to the pastor about it, and you're going to be putting a burden on your pastor that doesn't need to be put there. The pastor's job is not to be going around telling people what they should be doing. The pastor's job is, direct, is to direct them to Jesus Christ and to shepherd the sheep and to heal them and edify them and feed them. That is the pastor's job. The pastor's job is not to go and, you know, oh, this person's at this, I've got to go do that. That's just control and, and, and all that other stuff. What we need to do first is go to the Lord on all these things, as I've often preached before. Okay. And obviously that's implied, or Jesus doesn't say that specifically, but he says it everywhere else. You know, <laughs> seek first the kingdom of heaven. Seek first the Lord, your God. Okay. We need to go to him. This is why James says, be slow to speak. Be slow to speak. Okay. Slow to anger. Stop before it comes out. Maybe he'll just have you pray about that thing that you're concerned about, okay? Maybe he'll just have you, you know, um, sort of, you know, plead the blood of Jesus over that person, bind those spirits that are at work, okay, and deal with it that way. We so often mess things up by using our tongues. But if this person has sinned against you, and God says, you've got to deal with this, okay? God says, you've taken it to the Lord, you've prayed, you've been slow to speak, but then the Lord says, speak. Speak first to the person. Speak first to that person. Go to them and say to them, Brother, what is this you've done? What is going on here? And of course, come in a humble way, not an accusatory way and all that. Okay. Um, and obviously Jesus is talking here about things that are serious. Okay. Because it's even serious enough 
to be, let him be like a heathen or a tax collector to you. In other words, shun him until he comes to us. The way Paul does deals with this in the Corinthian church, it says that one that is engaged in sexual morality, you know, um, what, how did, what word does he use? He says, um, mm-hmm. deliver, him, <laughs> deliver him to, to Satan, yeah, to the destruction of the flesh. flesh. Exactly. Deliver him to Satan. In other words, let him out into the world. Okay. Okay. But then later, in the later, the later segment of this, he says, bring him back in. Restore him. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, in other words, you know, that, that's like the most serious that's <laughs> thing. Okay. So, <laughs> most of these things should never even have to get to that. Okay. They can be dealt with. Okay, when we put these things in divine order, it's God's heart that you be reconciled to your brother. If you pray about it, I know you're nervous, I know you're scared, I know you're, it's, you've got to swallow your pride and humble yourself, but if you do the difficult thing first, I believe that nine out of ten times, God's going to restore that relationship. Okay? One last thing I want to read that Jesus tells us to do is in, uh, it's in a couple places. The one we're going to look at is in Luke Um, chapter 6. Luke chapter 6, and this is from verse 37. Verse 37, Luke chapter 6. Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. Now, that's a whole teaching in itself. We're not going to get too much into that. But just think about that for a second, guys. What that's saying is, if that same incisive, piercing discernment (laughs) that you bring to bear in judging somebody else, that same level of incisive, piercing discernment is going to be used by God. I don't want God to be looking that hard at me. I just wanted to see the blood and Jesus' nature he's put in me. That's all I wanted to see. Which means I'm going to be pretty lenient on how I judge others. Okay, That's the measure. You get what you put in. You, 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 how you measure is measured back to you. But he goes on to say, he spoke a parable to them. Can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into the ditch? The disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye? But do not perceive the plank in your own eye. Or how can you say to your brother, Brother, let me remove the speck that is in your eye, when you yourself do not see the plank that is in your own eye. Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck that is in your brother's eye. Remember in the last one I was talking about how we need to pray first to God before we go. Too often, guys... What we do is we see something wrong in another person, and we either go blurting it out to them, or we go, more often than not, talk to other people about it, okay? But the point is, if we actually humbled ourselves before the Lord and prayed to the Lord about it, too often it will be the case that actually, what's in, the the problem is that that person pales in comparison to the thing that's going on. It is so, it's the same thing that Paul says in Romans chapter 2. You who judge, O oh man, are guilty of the same thing that you are judging for. I mean, guys, this is massive. This is so massive. We need to be so careful, okay? I'm not talking about, you know, not discerning spirits at work. I'm not talking about, you know, just blissfully putting our heads to the sand. and Everybody's fine, everybody's happy, everybody's nice. I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about is judgment and contempt in my heart for someone else. I'm talking about getting riled by other people and going and talking about them to other people. Okay? Well, that person, you know what they're doing, and they're doing this, and they're doing that. When the Lord wants to deal with something in me, okay, too often 
And this is, the enemy comes in so quickly to destroy a relationship through this, okay? Too often, we go to somebody, and we go, there's what I'm seeing. You better deal with this. Because it seems so big in our own eyes. When it seems so big in our own eyes, we've probably got a plank in ours. Go to God first. Humble yourself. Ask Him to show you. If this thing that's niggling in you about this other person is more about you than it is about them, ask Him to show you if you have a plank. Then, when He shows you your plank, you're like, good. He removes that, and all of a sudden you can see clearly. And you can see that actually that was just a speck in your brother's eye. And he will give you the grace and the seasoned speech to go and gently help your brother with that speck. That's the way it works. But too often what happens is we judge somebody prematurely, harshly. We use our discernment as a crutch, as an excuse. Okay? And the breakdown of a relationship begins through that. Okay? We cause offense. Okay? Now the thing about offense is, look, there's a spirit of offense, yeah. guys, and it needs to be utterly demolished. Okay? We have no business taking up offense. Okay? Now there's that saying that says offense is, you can't be given, it can only be taken. That's not exactly true. That's kind of a cop, right? Because, I mean, if you're being offensive to somebody, you know, they, maybe they shouldn't take up the offense, but you're not making it very easy for them, okay? So, so we, can't, we can't use that little slogan as an excuse to be offensive. But the point is, what's true about it is, guys, we have a decision to make when we are treated roughly, when we are disappointed in how people behave to us, what they do to us, what they say about us. Okay, we have a choice to make to take that offense up or to make. And the thing is, of course, it's not just an intellectual choice because sometimes it's just like you feel offended and you can't help it. But the point is, when that comes, you can say in the name of Jesus Christ, I rebuke that spirit of offense and I break it off me. For I'm a child of the living God. I am grafted in, adopted. I am his special treasure. I have no business taking up offense. I am beloved. I'm holy. I'm laying down that offense. I'm casting it off. I'm breaking it off me in the name of Jesus Christ. Okay? Because that offense just builds, the, 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 just increases in, um, the, uh, the break between two people. Right? It, it just makes a block for reconciliation. Okay? But by the same token, we don't want to be offensive. As Paul says, Striving not in my conscience not to be offensive to God or men, not to offend God or men. Okay. Um, now, if being loyal to God turns out to be offensive to some men, well, that's too bad. But you know what I mean? As much as is possible and as much as it depends upon us. Okay. So, what we can do with when we've got a plank in our eye and we see the speck in our brother's eye and we blow it out of proportion, we can go and cause a and there goes the beginning of the end of that relationship. Unless we are willing, okay, to ask for forgiveness, okay, to get that plank dealt with so that we're not a hypocrite, okay. And I just trust me on this, guys. Trust me, trust me, trust me, trust me, because I'm so familiar with this particular error and this mistake, okay. If you are just, if something just seems so wrong in your brother or sister, and you just can't shake it, and it's just like you're just so concerned about it, it's probably saying something more about you than it is about them. This is proved true with me every single time. Brother, sister, husband, wife, daughter, son, parent, whatever. If in that relationship you are certain that that person has got a real something in that just they need to deal with it and it's just annoying you and it's just getting under your skin. Okay. Go to the Lord and ask him if there's a blank in your eye. Go to him first. And he removes that blank. Okay? Because you repent of it. You get refilled with the Spirit.
Spirit. He gives you His wisdom. He gives you His eyes to see. And then you see, yeah, there's something there. Yeah, my brother, there's something that needs to happen. But whoa, that was nowhere near as big a deal as I thought it was. The bigger deal was in me. Okay? Resist, guys. Resist. <gasps> Resist until the Lord gives you His peace. Let the peace come from the Lord first. And then go deal with it. If you th The only way you can get your peace, okay, is by getting in there. Then it's probably something that needs dealt with in you. It's okay. You're human. It's okay. The Lord knows all about it. It's okay. He died so that you don't have to be held responsible for that. His blood makes you as white as snow. But just deal with it. Be real about it. None of us are above these things that the scripture is warning us about. Okay? And he puts them there. Jesus puts these things there for our well-being and the edification of the church, the edification of the body. Finally, guys, I just want to end by saying, why am I been talking about this? It's not because I am sensing uh, disunity, or far from it. It's the exact opposite. I, I sense great unity in the body. Okay? Um, but I'm being, it, and it's not because I know of particular things that are going on in people's lives and their relationships with, with family and so forth. But it's because, first and foremost, the Holy Spirit's been weighing, putting it on my heart. But also, what the Spirit is saying is, this is reality. This is life in the world, guys. This is the things that happen. We have to be on our guard against them. And we have to understand that when the enemy comes in, with these things, we have ways, holy ways, divine ways of dealing with them so that unity can be reestablished. Okay? Will that always be the case? No. As Jesus says, if you won't hear the church, okay, then let him be like a tax collector and a heathen. In other words, you dust down, okay? You, and you don't, not with bitterness and unforgiveness, but you just release that person to the Lord, okay? And sometimes that's how it has to be. But in as much as it depends upon you, and it probably depends upon you more than you're willing to believe, <laughs> and as much as it depends upon you, live peaceably with everyone. Okay? Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Jesus, we just thank you for your words, your wisdom, your truth, Lord. We just ask you, Lord, for these divine principles, this divine order, just to, for it to soak down into our hearts, Lord, and let it, let it just operate in our lives, Lord Jesus. Lord, we ask for protection from that spirit of contention and strife and disunity. We utterly trample it. We say we despise you. We reject you utterly. You have no place in the body of Christ. You have no place in our families, our communities, our neighborhoods, our workplaces. You have no place. We reject you. We reject you, disunity. We utterly, utterly break you off in Jesus' name. And Lord, we just release a hedge of protection, Lord, over our relationships, over our spouses, our children, our parents, over our brothers and sisters in Christ, Lord. We just release that hedge of protection, Lord. And we just release divine order over every relationship, Lord. That we would be yoked first and foremost to you. Not unequally yoked with any person or any other thing, Lord Jesus. Give us eyes to see, Lord. Give us divine order and solutions, Lord, in these cases. And Lord, where we have seen and allowed, Lord, disunity to enter in. Forgive us for washing our hands of it as though it doesn't depend upon us at all, Lord. Give us holy boldness. Give us humility and meekness. Give us love and compassion of Jesus Christ, Lord, to deal in a way that is holy and divine with those situations and bring, restore, restoration, Lord, to those relationships that have been broken, if that is your will. We just thank you, Jesus, that you are in all these things. And Lord, that you are just a light and a lamp through your word. Praise you, Jesus. Protect us, we pray. Nurture us, we pray. Edify us, Lord. Build us up till we all come to that measure of the stature of the fullness of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name.
Jesus' name we pray.